Um, so, um, so Jessica Hebner is a, a graduate student at Penn State College of Medicine. And I think it was uh, 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 Jess's advisor, Matt Swilios, who was um, wandering the floor of a, of a conference. It was Microscopy and Microanalysis 2019. And he, uh, he had a problem. Uh, uh, he works in a field where the data are always noisy all the time. He had a, a, a good problem and a bad problem. His good problem is he could generate lots of data. His bad problem was he didn't have a way of denoising and analyzing it and segmenting it. And he's just like, you know, looking for something that can help. And uh, can anybody solve this problem? And he stumbled on our booth and uh, it was kind of exciting for me because this is actually what I did my training in uh, a couple of decades ago was cryo uh, electron microscopy. And was like, oh yeah, I'd love to show you what you can do. And, and he gave it a try and it turns out it works great on his data and Jess is gonna tell us all about that. So Jess has been, are, are you Matt's first graduate student? Two, two graduate students at the same time. So, so Jess is going to come come on up here. Jess, Jess is going to tell us about uh, about work in uh, in cryoelectron tomography. Uh, she's going to tell us about uh, ultrastructural insights into cytoskeletal filament arrangement in neuronal growth cones. Let's welcome Jess. All right. Well, okay. Thank you. So. Like he said, uh, we do cryo-electron tomography. Uh, primarily, we are a neuron development lab. Uh, we study just growing neurons. We don't do any sort of pathology, anything like that. We're interested in moving into that eventually, but right now we're just studying normal developing neurons. We use a combination of light microscopy, so we use confocal microscopy, cryo-electron tomography, and now deep learning um, to analyze them. Neurons, when they're developing, send out these um, send out axonal processes uh, in order to guide them to their synaptic targets. There's actually a very highly specialized, here I'm gonna give myself a pointer. Okay. Um, so this highly specialized structure here, this neuron has four of them starting out here, is called the growth cone. This is the guidance machinery of the neuron. This structure is extremely dynamic. It is actin rich. Um, and it is what is responsible for sensing both uh, extracellular chemical cues, tactile cues, things like that to guide it to its synaptic target. Um, they're pretty divided as far as um, regions. So there's this outer region here that has both filopodia, which is bundled actin, um, but there's also this branched lamellopodia-like veil of branched actin. There's this transition zone where everything kind of gets a little bit muddy and is both actin and some microtubules. And then the axonal process here forms the central zone where there's organelles, microtubules, and all the translational machinery. Um, as I said before, growth cones are highly dynamic structures. This is um, not a very long time lapse. So this is, I think I want to say a 30 minute time lapse of a neuron. Um, dynamically changing as its filopodia extend and collapse. As they encounter extracellular cues, they can turn. They can really rapidly collapse the filopodia and turn in a different direction or turn towards a direction. Um, we study them uh, primarily because Matt has always been into neural um, development research, but they're also a really convenient target for cryo-electron tomography. There's a pretty strict uh, thickness in your sample. You need it to be below or thinner than 300 nanometers. Growth cones are very conveniently around 100 nanometers thick at their thickest, so they make for fantastic cryo-electron tomography targets. Uh, for anybody who has not seen cryo-electron tomography before, this is kind of the principle of it. So we have our sample here that is embedded in a thin layer of vitreous ice. Um, this is water ice that we've frozen so quickly that it can't form a crystalline structure, so we can send electrons through it. Unlike CT scanners, where we get to have a full 360 degree view, uh, with cryo-electron tomography, both our electron gun and our detector are stationary, so we have to tilt our sample back and forth. Downside of this is that we end up with a missing wedge of data. Um, usually we're tilting from about plus 60 to minus 60, so we have a pretty significantly missing wedge of data, but we are still taking our 2D projection images. We back project them and come up with a 3D volume. Uh, this is kind of what the scale that we work at is, uh, so each of these electron grids, which is where we're growing our cells, is around three, uh, three millimeters. Um, we are growing cells on there. We usually end up with around 150 cells on a grid if we're lucky. Um, and if we're even luckier, we'll get the whole grid that has good ice. But you can see on this grid, there's a lot of, lot of, lot of grid that doesn't have good ice. And so we really need to be able to see the full square here to image through it. 
And as we zoom in more, you'll see that maybe we get one neuron per grid square if we're lucky. Um, and even zooming further in is this is about the window that we're imaging at. So we're imaging very small regions of a single cell at a time. Um, so we tilt back and forth across the tilt axis here, and we end up with a cellular tomogram. One of the things that we have noticed in a lot of our data as we've been imaging these and producing significant amounts of data, this is in vitro data just for ease of display, but we do see this in our real data, which I'll show you later, um, is that we're seeing two different types of filaments in a lot of our data. So here and here are normal actin filaments. They're just, they're part of your cytoskeleton. They're a helical filament, so they're made up of a bunch of monomers and they twist around themselves. And as they twist around themselves, there's a known helical pitch. In the middle, what we're seeing is a filament that looks very different from regular actin filaments, but we still think it looks like an actin filament. Like it's still the same density, the same width. Pretty sure it's an actin filament, but we're really curious as to what it was. So we did a lot of subtomogram averaging. So this is where we take subregions of our data, average it together to recover some signal and some of the high resolution information. And when we do that over the normal actin filaments, uh, what we found is that they have the normal expected helical pitch of 36 nanometers. So they form one full revolution over six, 36 nanometers. Um, and so when we did subtomogram averaging, we can take the high resolution structure here in green and overlay it over our much lower resolution density. And what we found here is that when we average the different filament together, uh, they have a much shorter helical pitch. They're much more twisted and they're much broader. And through a lot of searching, uh, we finally figured out that what the, we're seeing is actually an actin filament that's fully decorated in the actin binding protein cofilin. This was really interesting to us because um, canonically, cofilin is an actin severing protein, but we're seeing it fully decorating stable filaments, which is a phenomenon that is commonly described in Alzheimer's disease, um, in pathology of Alzheimer's disease, but is not described in normal developing neurons. So we went down the path of trying to figure out what the heck we were seeing in our data. Um, so this is kind of my lab mates project. Um, when we were fluorescently labeling these, what we found is that as we follow along Philopodia, so the bundled actin that's in there, we were seeing fasten, which is the actin bundling protein, up to a point, so in green is fasten, but in red is cofilin. And so as you follow along the Philopodia, what we found is that there's a really noticeable region where they're exclusively binding or mutually exclusively binding. And there's really not any regions where you see them binding together. There was always a transition zone of, you know, here's cofilactin, here's fasten. We're not seeing them mixed together. And when we did um, some movies, some time-lapse movies, and this is a maximum intensity projection. So this is all of the maximum intensity pixels overlaid on each other. What we found is that actually it, it matters where in the growth cone this transition region was. That if the transition zone happened to be kind of behind this lamellipodial veil here, it's so you can see that the red here is kind of, it's very smeared, which means that the base of the filament is the part that's moving um, a whole lot more than the tip of the philopodia. And we saw the opposite when that transition region was pushed out in front of the lamellipodial veil, which is that when it's up here further out, it's the tip of the philopodia that's moving. Uh, we also commonly saw it uh, really is a feature of anytime there was waves or breaking or bending of filaments, it was almost always at these transition regions. And so as a very high level summary of my lab mates project, right now what we think is happening is that when cofilin binds to the, the filaments, it's ejecting fasten from it and it's kind of creating this tunable hinge point. So that's creating flexibility in these filaments and allowing them to, it's really facilitating their searching behavior and that really highly dynamic behavior that we've been seeing in growth cones when they're searching for their synaptic target. Um, and so this is kind of where my project came in. So we had, you know, all right, we have this novel finding. We have, um, we think we know what's going on. And now we have five years of tomographic data. And so my PI is like, all right, I want you to go in and I want you to characterize uh, the cofilactin distribution in all of our data which was a huge, insanely big project, um, considering that the gold standard for segmenting cryotomographic data right now is uh, hand segmentation. 
Um, so I really quickly uh, pivoted and went right down the deep learning path because I didn't want to do that. Um, I really couldn't even imagine coming up with any sort of meaningful data from that. So this is kind of a characteristic uh, data set from, from some of our images. You can see that the, dense, the actin mesh is incredibly dense in here. So segmenting this by hand would have just been incredibly crazy. Uh, but unfortunately, segmenting it with deep learning at first didn't work out very well because because of our data and the nature of cryo-electron tomography. As Mike said previously, it's very noisy. There is not really much way to clean that up. Uh, there's not any way to take get better signal. Um, and we have some uh, imaging artifacts because we're missing a wedge of data. So in Z, which I don't have an image of here, uh, we have some fairly big anisotropy uh, in our signal, in our structures. And so it can really be very difficult to hand segment any amount of them accurately. And what you can see here is, so this here is cofilactin. It's a big bundle of cofilactin, cofilin decorated actin filaments. And over here is just regular actin. But even segmenting just these two boxes by hand um, didn't give me a very good training set. And so when I tried to do deep learning segmentation of this to differentiate these filaments, I really didn't have great success with this. Um, I think maybe now that I've had a lot more experience, I could do better. But at the start, we really just didn't have a great success. And so thankfully, at that point, my other lab mate joined the lab, and we went down the path of simulating our data. Because we said, you know, all right, if we can give it better ground truth, better training information, if we can fake our data, we can train a better network to identify the real structures in our data. And so we created a MATLAB-based um, simulation program to simulate cryotomographic data. Uh, this has been a couple years in the making. Um, we're just about ready to publish it, where we're taking protein model structures, so super high resolution structures, we're generating density maps, and then we are simulating our data as if it were a real cryotomogram. Um, there are a lot of things to model for cryotomographic data. You have to model your electron dose, the damage, the detector, the missing wedge, all of these things. Um, and so we've gone through and very systematically tested that and gotten to the point where now we can actually use uh, fake data to train our real networks. And so in practice, what this looks like, so we're generating a model here. So this is all fake data, and this is just the model. There's no aberrations added to this or anything like that. And what we do is we simulate a tilt series from this. So this simulates our missing wedge now. So now we're adding that feature in. We can simulate electron dose and the CTF convolution, which is just the mathematical function telling us some of the damage that's happening in our <laughs> electron detection. Um, and then we end up with a fully fake tomogram that looks very similar to real data. Uh, one of my favorite parts about this is that because we uh, made this in intending to use it in Dragonfly is that we also generate an atlas. And so this atlas basically gives us each protein in here has a different intensity. And so we can super quickly go from this to a full ground truth with a click of a button. And when we've started training with simulated data, what we found is that we can go from this original, which was all hand-trained data, to something that works much better. Um, and so we were really, really excited about this uh, result. Um, it was working really beautifully for identifying cofilactin from actin. And so then we got really ambitious and we're like, all right, Let's try to do all of the proteins that we routinely see. We'll simulate them, we'll train on simulated data, and then we'll apply it to real data. That didn't work as well. Um, so this is uh, an example of one of our real cellular tomograms. Again, so you're seeing, uh, I think there's eight different features in here, a bunch of different proteins. There's ribosomes and microtubules. And what we learned really quickly is that we're not good enough yet at simulating whole cellular data to do that alone. But we kind of landed on a dual training strategy where we give it just a little bit of real data and a lot of fake data. And we can end up with a network that segments whole cellular tomograms in about 20 minutes um, very accurately. And so what we're moving on now is now I can take you know, full segmentations. I can take full data sets. We have hundreds of growth cone tomograms. And we have one model that is trained to do all of them. And so that model that I just showed you can be applied to this data set, which again is a very densely packed 
tomogram. There's microtubules all over the place in here. There's ribosomes and actin filaments. And I can go from that to something like this again in about 20 minutes. So we're dramatically speeding up the process. And so now my project has become, all right, now we have a couple hundred tomograms that I need to apply this to and start to extract meaningful information from. And so we're scaling up again and we're going through, all right, well now I have, this is an entire growth cone here once it loads. Um, so this is a whole growth cone here. You can see outlined here and we have about 26 tomograms that were taken over this. And these are overlaid exactly where they were taken from this region of the cell. So now that I have segmentations of everything, I can start to go through and quantify at a very high resolution level, protein distribution, protein associations, things like that, and start to do that over whole cells. And so we have a data set now that's about 26 cells, I wanna say. This slide's gonna take a second to load because it's there's a lot of information on this. So as these play, so this is around 26 growth cones of data, um, around 145 or 150 segmentations that I've been able to do. And this is all one model that's segmenting this. And so now I'm having to go back through and quantify everything. And we're making a protein atlas essentially of neuronal growth cones so that when we, now we can go back and start to make changes. We can perturb different proteins and say, all right, well, what changes globally over the growth cone at the, at the cryotomogram level? Um, some of the things that have come out of this already, as I've just been um, analyzing the data a little bit, is that anytime we have data that has this protein called TRIC in it, which is a chaperone protein and helps protein folding, um, it's specifically responsible for tubulin and actin monomers, which are your microtubules and your actin filament monomers. Uh, whenever we see it in our data, we're seeing it clustered together very regularly. And so we're really curious about if it's self-associating, if there are proteins that are associating it, um, so we, I mean, everybody knows if you're in the biology world that polyribosomes are a thing so that ribosomes form together into trans, um, translational machinery, transcriptional machinery. Um, but there is no description of trick doing the same thing. And so we don't have any idea what is associating it, why it's associating anything like that. So now we're moving towards trying to really investigate what is happening there if it's associated with actin filaments or with microtubule filaments, or if it's just associating all on its own. So we have no idea, but that's one of our observations that we see. And one of the other ones that we see, this is a little hard to see um, at this scale. So in some of our data where we have, these are microtubule filaments all running along here, and there are in this box a bunch of rings that we were really very confused about what they were. And so we trained a model to segment them because I wasn't gonna do it by hand. Um, and when we averaged a couple of them together, what we actually think we're seeing are these are tubulin rings. So microtubules are made up of protofilaments. So there's 13 protofilaments that make the full filament, 12 to 13, depending on. Um, and it's known that tubulin can form these little bitty rings as a byproduct. They don't know if they're a ring of monomers to build more filaments from. They don't know if they're a breakdown product, anything like that. But we're seeing them in our data pretty routinely. And so now we're kind of trying to figure out well, all right, are we seeing a breakdown product? Are we seeing, is this a pool of, of monomers to pull from? Um, but it's great because we have a, a network that can now segment them very quickly. I can easily identify them in all my data, and then we can start to really analyze what's going on with them. And then the very last thing is we thought it was fun is in my off time, I like to pull data from the EMDB and just segment it for fun. And we were, um, we wanted to see if, um, a network that we'd trained on rat neurons, so that's all of our data is hippocampal rat neurons. We wanted to see how well it worked on other species, if it was robustly inferable, and turns out it very much is. So this is data just pulled from EMDB, mouse neuron, and human RP1 cell. I saw them and I was like, hey, these have a lot of the proteins that I see, I wanna see how they do. And so I downloaded them and ran my network on them after pre-processing them, and it works fantastically. And so we're really excited about having this model um, and starting to share it with as many people as we can. And with that, I'd love to thank my lab and thank Dragonfly for having me out. Well, thank you very much, Jess. That's, uh, that's really terrific. I, it must be daunting to have 150 to 200 tomograms worth of data to, uh, to analyze, but uh, it must also be a, a blessing to have something that'll help you crunch the data quite quickly. Yes. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna treat the Zoom audience to the first question. 
Um, so Eric, uh, if you read the question loud enough for the people, yeah, you read the question and then I'll read it again. <laughs> How well does a trained uh, model extrapolate to other data? And then uh, how do you normalize the data so that they are well suited to work uh, all with the same model? I think that's mostly the question. Yes. So um, as I showed, it works great with other data. Um, the primary thing for cryo-electron tomography data is it does need to be the same pixel size. Um, we did actually with simulated data, we could quickly test. I think it, we had about a 15% pixel size difference, and you could still infer it really well. Um, for reference, our pixel size for most of my data is like 13.2 angstroms per pixel. Um, so you could go up to about 14 or down to 12, and it will infer really well. Um, that's the primary uh, limiting factor for this. Um, and as far as normalizing the data or getting it all to work, uh, we actually use Dragonfly's Calibrate feature. Um, so if you calibrate your data and kind of put it all into the same intensity scale uh, beforehand, networks infer really robustly across data sets. Outstanding. Uh, questions from the audience in the, in the room. Uh, Natalie. Right. So, so in the complicated cellular ultrastructure milieu where you just have a, a big soup of everything, uh, how can you, you know, pick out the, the, the toasted croutons from the garlic croutons? How can you pick out all these different cellular components? That is a big question in cryotomographic data. Um, so for us, we have gone through and said, all right, we think this is trick. We are pretty sure it's trick. We're going to identify everything that looks like trick. And then what we do is we go back through and we do subtomogram average things. So we average it all together and then we fit the models back onto it. So like I showed with the actin filaments, we do model fitting. Um, there are other strategies you can use um, template matching. So if you have a known structure, you can create a template from it and then do, you know, go look for that template in your data. Um, and then there's also de novo pattern mining where they say, all right, we're going to find everything that looks like a structure, and then we're going to sort all of the ones that look like the same structure into one class, and so we're going to sort all of the ones that look like a different structure into another class, and then we average those all together, and then we try to figure out what they are. And have you identified anything unknown? Not in our data yet. Right now, we're just sticking with identifying what we can totally see. Uh, eventually, yes, we'd absolutely love to move on to <coughs> identifying new features. I think we can do one more question if we have one. Yes, Joshua? Uh, I did not do any of it. <laughs> um, anyway, I was just kind of a, a, a little thing. Uh, on one of your slides, you showed a defocus as a negative pi for a mm -hmm. micrometer. And I was just kind of wondering how defocus can be negative unless you're doing some kind of preferential. So the, the question is, uh, what does it mean to defocus in a TEM? What does a, a five microns under focus mean? Yeah, so uh, we shooting at focus on a cryo-electron microscope basically nullifies your signal. You are not going to see much of anything. Um, so we tend to shoot under focus. So we'll back everything down and we usually shoot about five microns under focus. So we call it negative five, but it's just five microns under focus um, so that you can really start to see it's, I wish I had the, we can actually simulate that where you can see at focus, it looks nothing like what you would expect it to. And as you back further and further off of focus in a cryo-electron microscope, you can actually start to see, all right, that looks like a protein, that looks like, and it really helps to boost the signal. And so we tend to shoot below focus so that we can actually see what we're looking for. And, and in the... Uh, the filter back projection algorithm for mm -hmm. that? Yeah. In the, in the light microscopy world, you know, you may have a, a sample stage that's at focus and you can raise the stage or lower the stage and it's no longer in the focal plane. Yeah. It's basically what we're doing when we're pulling at five microns out of uh, under focus and under focus and through focus will have different contrasts. So the, the microscopists tell you which way they're shooting and it's always under focus. It's always under focus. I never thought to ask why. I think the question is you can only tilt plus or minus 60. Yeah, with I think those some stages, stages can go around like to 
plus or minus 70, but 60 is typical. That's what most of us do, but we can, or we can simulate whatever you want. Um, but yeah, typical data sets are plus or minus 60. So before we thank Jess, uh, this is a, a note for the, the internet listeners. Uh, uh, Jess has uh, been posting a lot on Twitter and every time she shows a segmentation success, the, the Twitter lights up and is like, wow, I have the same data, how do, I, how do I do this? And I'm just telling you, you can keep asking Jess those questions until the end of April and then she needs a couple of months to write. So, uh, so don't get your questions in now. Don't don't bombard her while she's uh, she's writing up her uh, her thesis this summer. So uh, let's uh, let's thank Jess for this really terrific work. <laughs>